Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Authors in Conversation panel featuring the 2024 Minnesota Book Awards finalists in the competitive children's literature category. The Minnesota Book Awards is a program of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library in the organization's capacity as the Minnesota Center for the Book. My name is Bao Fee. I am a children's book author, spoken word artist, and poet. I've been nominated in the past for Minnesota Book Awards in children's literature, as well as in poetry. And I've also worked for many years in the nonprofit Loft Literary Center serving readers and writers. As we get started, we would like to take a moment, a very important moment, to acknowledge the Dakota people, indigenous keepers of the land on which most of us on this panel recording are participating from today. This land was reserved for the Dakota in the Treaty of Traverse des Sioux, signed with the United States in 1851, and it remains sacred to them today. We also acknowledge the Ojibwe people, fellow indigenous inhabitants of the land. The Dakota and the Ojibwe people are the original stewards of story in this place now called Minnesota. The Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, organizers of the Minnesota Book Awards, honor this tradition and the knowledge and the values embedded in it as we all work together to lift up storytellers in our state. For the latest installment of the Minnesota Book Awards popular Meet the Finalist series, I am overjoyed to be joined by Corey Dorfeld, author of Beneath, published by Little Brown Books for Young Readers, Hatchet Book Group. Junata Petras, author of Can We Please Give the Police Department to the Grandmothers, published by Dutton Children's Books, Penguin Random House. Laura Purdy Salas, author of Finding Family, The Duckling Raised by Loons, published by Millbrook Learner Publishing Group. And last but certainly not least, Ty Chapman, author of Looking for Happy, published by Beaming Books, 1517 Media. Congratulations to each and every one of you. All writers are special, but we all know picture book writers, we're special, special. Uh, and so uh, there's hundreds of children's books uh, published every year. They're always wonderful. And so I hope you all feel honored to even make it into this esteemed category. It's a, it's a joy to be here with you today. In the interest of making the most of our short time together, we're gonna start with a round robin question that each of you are going to answer. Uh, and and then I'll I'll have specific questions for each of you and your your wonderful wonderful books. So the first question we would like you to answer. Um, this is for all of you. These are all books that reward repeated reading and reading together, both of which are so important in books for young readers. So if each of you could talk about how you approach creating a book that makes for enjoyable repetition. Do you take into account the adults who might be sharing these books with young readers in their lives? And if so, when? And uh, let's start with Ty. Excellent, hello. Um, so to answer the question, honestly, I don't sit down to craft my books with this idea in my head of, okay, how can I make this as rereadable as possible? Um, but I do pay attention to specific craft elements uh, that happen to support repetition. Um, when I write a picture book, I approach it like a poem. Um, every line, stanza, and page, I'm reading the work aloud to ensure it flows like a poem or a song, uh, to ensure it lends itself to performance. Because uh, that's ultimately what story times are, right? Like whether you're an author reading to a crowd of kids at a school visit that gives you COVID, or if you're a parent reading to their child before bed, it's all a performance. Um, and I also really try to center hope in my books for young people as much as possible. Uh, even when I'm writing about difficult themes like racism or mental health issues, I make sure to end my books on a hopeful note, one that leaves the young reader empowered and feeling good. And I think that too lends itself to multiple readings. So to answer the second question concerning adults, um, I honestly don't really consider adults too, too much throughout my drafting process um, because that's not who my books are for. Obviously they're the performers, right? They're the ones buying and reading these books to children. Um, they're the ones hopefully engaging in, in meaningful conversations around the themes of the book. So I'll include back matter that can guide conversations and such, but ultimately my books aren't for or about adults. Um, they're not my first, second, or even third consideration when I'm writing these books, the kids are. 
Um, however, I do think quality storytelling kind of transcends age. Um, though I don't write my books with adults in mind, I've had many adults tell me how much my books have meant to them and their families. Um, you know, I've heard of teenagers resonating with looking for happy, college students, adults in their 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, and there are plenty of examples in children's, uh, of children's media resonating with adults. Um, Studio Ghibli and Pixar come to mind. Um, but I think the second we start catering to adults rather than children, as children's book writers, we've kind of already lost the plot a little bit. Um, just like a playwright doesn't write a script for their actors, I don't write books for the folks reading them to children. I write for the child audience. Great. Thank you for that provocative answer, Ty. Uh, maybe Corey, could you go next? Sure. Wow, it's so interesting to even hear these answers uh, myself from other creators. Uh, so like Ty, when I actually sit down to work on an idea for a book, I typically am not evaluating it or thinking about what's going to make this a book that everyone wants to read again and again or something you return to. But uh, so because you asked the question, I... Uh, try to think of what I'm doing when I make a story. And I think it's attempting to create a space that people want to return to. So there's something about that story, that environment, that emotional experience you go through when you read it, that maybe seems a little familiar. So like in my book, Beneath, there's a grandfather and a child uh, who go on a walk. They're just going on a walk. So that might be something familiar. But then I also like to put in things that seem new, things that maybe a child has never really thought about before and is excited to finally see or learn about. So that maybe would be where you bring in um, all the beneath elements or hidden parts of the book where we're seeing these cutaways of the earth, what's hidden beneath there, uh, the layers, you know, what's beneath animals, um, and then hopefully leads to more questions more discoveries, things they can take beyond that book. Maybe then they go on a walk and start to think about what's beneath the ground they're walking on, you know, what's inside the little bird egg they see and just kind of um, creates a whole experience beyond that book that, that maybe they then return to later that night. And I feel like if anything, and this brings in the adult, I'm always hoping I make uh, discussions happen, especially when the topics are a little bit more difficult or tricky to explain to a child. Um, like how do you really help a kid understand when I feel like so many adults don't still grasp that everyone you see uh, has inner struggles, has things that they're facing that you might know nothing about. Uh, so I think if you can put that in a picture book, it not only helps the adult start that difficult conversation but it becomes something they can return to again and again uh, when they maybe feel lost again. If the kid has more questions or needs another explanation, they can be like, why don't we, why don't we pull out that book again? <laughs> and we can talk about that and, and just, it can become a tool. Cause I know I myself as a teacher, as a parent, uh, there were many times that I didn't know where to start when my kids asked a question. And I feel like picture books are such a special experience in general because usually it's shared between two people usually an adult and a child and I think there's just something so intimate and amazing about that that they each kind of come with their own experiences and um, enjoy the book on different levels and uh, can continue to discuss and expand on everything that uh, the book might offer. Wonderful. Thank you for giving us that illumination, Corey. And maybe next, Junata, could you go? Yeah. Um, so this kid's book was first just like a poem I wrote in a very tender kind of emo exploration of like Black death by police. Um, it first, the poem first came to me I think it was after it was after Michael Brown's murderer was acquitted and a lot of the testimony he gave was that Michael Brown seemed like a monster and like had this superhuman strength and um and just thinking about him being like an 18 year old young man you know boy in a lot of ways too um and I think like a lot of my poetry is kind of like 
you know, like I, the poetry I write is not like the poem this book became, came from. So I always feel like, oh, you know, like when I was writing the poem, it wasn't a thing that I had an idea that it would be a kid's book eventually. Like it very much was like my feelings um, of how do I think about this thing that seems so heavy, so, so constant. Like I often have to remember which person was murdered by police that resulted in this poem. Um, and I started writing it and then um, I was working with um, the Heart of the Beast Theater, which does the Mayday Parade, which is this huge mask and puppet theater parade that happens in South Minneapolis. What up, South Minneapolis? And um, and yeah, it was just this thing where like they were, you know, the theme that year was Black Lives Matter and everybody was making a parade section, addressing it in whatever way. And that's, you know, how the Mayday Parade usually works. It's like social justice themed and they might work on the environment one year or, you know, indigenous rights or capitalism, you know, all hippie kind of vibes. Um, and I really was interested in how do I talk about heavy with sweetness and dreamfulness and vision? Because I think being an activist for, you know, since I've been like a teen, specifically around police brutality, but like any social justice thing, like I'm in the streets and I'm, you know, wanting to have solidarity and support folks. Um, I realized like just how exhausting it is to kind of focus on the problem and the heavy and the obstacles of it. and how do we create visions and opportunities and prompts for people to be like, oh yeah, but yes, we want to burn it all down. And once it's down, like, what is it that we actually want to live in? And I feel like the poem was me channeling in some ways, the elders who worked on the blocks that I, um, or lived on the blocks that I used to work on, specifically in Harlem and in South Minneapolis, who, when they encountered young people, had such a sense of authority from a place of love and a place of sweetness and a place of seeing the divine in people um, where the police state that we experience often is this authority that comes from guns, comes from um, all of this you know, power um, that is meant to sort of put people in their place and actually um, threaten people's lives. Or And it's also very uh, not just at all. Um, and I thought about the young, the, the young people who lived particularly in this block I worked at in Harlem, who would be stopped by NYPD all the time. A lot of these kids had PTSD from police. Um, and the elders in the community had so much love and care and like would pull them in and whatnot. So the book or the poem really came from that. And then it was actually um, Ricardo Levens Morales, who's also Southside. Um, uncle revolutionary spirit who um, loved the poem and was like, this poem should be a kid's book. And that's the first time I thought about it was in 2017. I was like, oh, that sounds kind of cute. Like I didn't think about it that way. And I brought it up to my agent. My agent was like, you know what? This It's a great poem, but it's not really formatted for a kid's book. So we had it, you know, um, published in a young adult anthology in 2017 or 2018. And then uh, fast forward to 2020 when George Floyd is murdered. Um, and then the poem always felt like a eulogy poem after I first wrote it. Because whenever a police death would happen, everybody would share the poem on Facebook. So it always felt like, a, it started to feel like a death poem. And then, you know, in 2020, when George Floyd happened, that happened again. And people really started to look at it as an abolitionist poem, which shifted something. Where I was like, oh, well, actually we're not just saying, and the police state, we're saying this is what we need instead. We actually need community care and all of that. And then my agent was approached by somebody who's like, hey, this should be a kid's book. And then all of a sudden she was like, oh, and I love my agent. Me, She's no longer my agent due to her, not, I mean, because she had to move on, not because of anything, but it was like, oh, okay. And that's like the publishing industry, right? You know, it's like, um, it's a business, <laughs> it's capitalism. So then it became a kid's book. And actually, I remember the first time seeing it as a kid's book, it just made me like I was balling, balling. I was like, oh, my gosh, because that's what's so dope about these illustrators is they're able to really convey the emotion of words like it elevates it in a way that renews it to you. So 
I love now reading it as this beautiful kids book with all of these. And I also didn't want to position it as one gender or one race um, or age when we talk about grandmas. Like I created this acronym grandma as giving radical abolition now dreams magically awaken. And I asked the illustrator to have the grandmas in the book be all ages and genders too. So it wasn't also positioning black women as saviors in the ways that when I wrote the poem, I didn't think it would be so a thing. And um, so that was really beautiful to see how she was able to depict all of these bodies bringing in and spirits. Sometimes I don't like when people say bodies because it's kind of like, mm, it kind of feels like it's disconnecting us from our souls, but like to see all these souls and spirits being able to show up in community in this loving way. So yeah, it's like, so I guess in a way, I think all of us are kids, like I'm 42 and I entirely feel seven a lot of the time. And sometimes I feel 15 and sometimes I feel like I'm in my eighties, you know? So I do feel like age is nothing but a number, Aaliyah. Um, but I do feel that um, I'm grateful to see a book that is a kid's book, but honors grandma energy. So in that way, it's like inherently intergenerational. So, and like elders love it, kids love it. You know, it, it it's cute. So yeah. Beautiful. That's my Thank answer. You. Yeah, no, beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. Thank you so much. And we're, I can't wait to delve uh, more into your book specifically in just a few moments. Uh, before we get to your specific question, uh, Laura, would you answer the, the round robin question? Sure. Um, so I do think about repetition or rereadability, um, not when I'm first writing something, you know, I want to write something I'm passionate about, and I have to figure out the um, kind of the structure of it and what is the story I'm trying to tell. But then when I get to the point where I'm actually looking at wording and phrasing, um, I do think about that rereading. As a mom of two daughters, and I'm sure this is sacrilege, but there was a very classic popular children's book that, oh my gosh, I was so thrilled to recycle because I was so dang sick of reading that book every freaking night for like months. Um, and, you know, I don't want a parent to feel that way about my book. Um, so having grown really weary of some books that we read over and over, I, I do think of the adults. Um, what I try to do for uh, the kids to make the rereading appealing for kids is... First of all, like I think Ty said, you know, he reads it out loud a gazillion times and you're looking for those words that just flow and have just the right impact. But also, like in Finding Family, I think the questions help make it more interactive. And so hopefully the kids are engaged and maybe the first time they have no idea, you know, what the answer is. But after a few readings, maybe they have formulated their own idea of what has happened at various times in that story. Um, and the repeated phrases that I picture and hope that after a reading or two, kids might be joining in on nobody knows or but duckling does. Um, so that repetition is not only pleasing to me just from a sort of lyrical poetry um, approach, but also hopefully to get the kids in there. And um, thinking about the adults, besides making it fun to read and having a lot of back matter so they can answer other questions, I, I only thought of this on reflection when you asked this question, but I did think, you know, maybe this nobody knows aspect is like, maybe that's a relief for adults because so many kids think, oh, grownups or Google has all the answers. And of course we don't. Um, and so I felt like, oh, maybe that kind of, maybe that lets some of the grownups reading this story that has a very unknown ending to it. Um, maybe that is kind of a relief in that way too, where it's like, oh yeah, I don't know. Let's, let's read the book again. <laughs> let's lay the, you know, the reality in what really happened and not in my having to try to come up with some answer for you. So 
So I do think about those things later in the process. Thank you for your insight, Laura. We we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for answering the, the general question. Now we're going to move into uh, each author. We have individual questions for you. We're going to go in alphabetical order by last name again. So Ty, we're going to start with you. So the first question I have for you is, uh, at the end of your book, there's this lovely dedication for everyone whose brains get noisy. Uh, and the character in the book, what a lovely book. The character is, you know, uh, basically has a very hard time shaking the blues throughout most of the book. So can you talk about why you decided to tell the story of this character? Yeah, um, I would I would love to speak on that. Um, as a kid, I grew up with a lot, a lot, a lot of big feelings. Um, I was diagnosed with anxiety and depression as a teenager, but I was living with those undiagnosed symptoms uh, from a very young age. Um, I'd have days where I felt profoundly blue and couldn't articulate why. I'd also have days where my mind was full of anxiety. I'd tell on myself uh, if I broke a rule. I'd apologize for anything and everything. Um, it got to the point where my teachers started telling me to stop apologizing, right? So um, when I was a young kid, there weren't a lot of books like Looking for Happy. Um, in fact, a lot of children's books push this idea that crying was for babies, right? That you had to toughen up and move through sad feelings without um, really feeling or addressing them in meaningful ways. Um, and there also just wasn't a lot of language for mental health issues and sadness for young people. Um, at least I can only speak for the books I read growing up. Um, I'm not gonna say those books didn't exist at all, um, but there weren't a lot of them if, if they were around. Um, and I think that's changing now and that's beautiful. Um, but that is kind of, it was, it was, um, an element of writing the book I wish I had. Um, and I think also there's an interesting intersection where um, blackness and mental health is concerned. Um, black people are not a monolith. We don't all think about anything in one specific way. However, I have noticed uh, somewhat frequently um, some black parents um, or adults can adopt this sort of sense of um, we live in a very hard place to live. You've got to be tough in order to endure that. Um, and I understand that logic. And I also really want to push the notion to both kids and adults that, uh, yes, it, 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 is, it is a hard place that we live in. And so it is that much more important to feel and process all of the things that we are shouldering daily, right? Um, so there's that element of it as well. Uh, my hope is ultimately that this book can do a couple of things. Uh, one, I hope that it can lend young people the language they need to articulate what they're feeling. Um, no kid, in my opinion, no kid should have to wait until they're 16 or 17 for the adults in their lives to realize something is up with their emotions. Um, and while they probably won't be self-diagnosing themselves with moderate depression, they might be able to say things like, my chest is full of rocks today, or my mind is full of noise today, right? If the book can do that alone, I think it's done its work. Um, and then two, my hope is that this book can normalize the fluidity of feelings, um, that hard days are simply a part of the human experience um, and that more often than not, they're temporary. Uh, that even if you don't have the means to shake the sorrow yourself, a brighter day or a happy song is always around the corner, which can sound cliche, but I do. Learning that in, in my own life as a young adult was, was kind of world changing. So my hope is that if I can give that to kids at a very young age, they won't have to take such a long roundabout route to get to some level of joy. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you. And really co-sign everything you said. What a wonderful book. And and thank you for, for identifying a need and writing towards that need. So what I love about this book is that the main character can't really explain why he feels sad, but his grandma never gives up on him which is a beautiful thing. So can you talk about what you want both kids and caretakers reading this book together to, to take from that? Yeah, um, so grandma doesn't give up on him because she knows how it feels to be down, right? Uh, we all do, whether we like to be transparent about it or not. Um, on the kid front, grandma serves as another reminder that sadness and bad days are normal, right? That even adults experience these issues, that they're profoundly hard to move through sometimes and that it's okay to take some time to feel sad and to move through it and to ask for help. Um, on the caretaker front, grandma is modeling the sort of compassion and patience that adult caretakers should be ready to lend a sorrowful child, in my opinion. Um, 
during my time as an educator and just as a person on the internet, it wasn't uncommon for me to hear adults um, sharing the sentiment of, oh, what does this kid have to be have to have to be sad about? Why are they stressed? They don't even pay bills, right? All they have to do is go to school, so on and so forth. Um, I've even heard parents share the sentiment with their children, and that's not my place to judge. I'm not a parent. Um, but I do think that if we adults spent some more time being empathetic towards our young people, understanding that they're living in unprecedented times right along with us, that we might have happier, healthier adults. Um, and so for the kids, it's really reinforcing normalcy of feelings and the full range of human emotions. And for adults, it's modeling compassion, because uh, I think a lot of us seem to lose sight of that as we grow. Beautiful, wonderful, cosign all of that. Thank you so much, Ty. So next up, we have Corey. Um, so Corey, your beautiful book is very much about both the surface and what lies beneath it. Uh, for those of you who haven't uh, experienced the book yet, which I highly recommend, uh, when readers go through it, they can see uh, pictures of an entire of entire worlds beneath the feet of your characters. Um, the characters themselves can't see the worlds that you illuminate as an illustrator and a creator of the story. So can you talk a little bit about that strategy? Um, absolutely. Uh, and it's so unique or interesting to be the only one here who is both the author and illustrator of this same book. And I only say that because I think that initial creative spark is a little different for me and that it kind of all melts together. So usually my books, the way I like to describe it, are almost like if you're remembering a movie. So I might see images and think about characters and it's more like remembering a, a scene or a feeling. So with Beneath, um, that actually uh, came from when my grandfather passed away. Uh, it was about 10 years ago. And I know even though I was still an adult then, I remember just for the first time really realizing that everyone in my family from the oldest to the youngest was going through this grieving process, saying goodbye to my grandpa, but the way they looked could be so different. And it made me think about how for kids, um, sometimes that can seem really unsettling or make them feel like an outsider. Um, as we've kind of talked about a lot today, kids can have really big emotions and sometimes they let it out. It's just what feels natural to them where adults sometimes seem a little bit more reserved. Uh, some adults tend to not openly express how they're feeling and that sometimes can send a message to children that maybe those emotions are not okay or they should keep them bottled inside. So that's kind of what I was thinking about. So that's a big topic. That's a lot of things to think about. And so how do you show that? How could you show children, especially in a way that might engage them, that people, the world around us, um, there's more to that story. You don't just take everyone and everything at its surface level. And I know for me, I've always loved biology, the natural world. Um, and so I was thinking about this story and I actually was on a field trip with my son's class at the Minnesota Zoo. And if you've been there, maybe you know what I'm talking about, but they have um, a giant snake skeleton. And that was kind of a weird light bulb moment for me where I saw this giant skeleton. And even though it was a snake, um, it had ribs, it had a spine, and there was something about it that I could still think about, like, that kind of looks like human bones as well. Like there's some kind of relation there, but I wouldn't know that if I didn't see, you know, the, the inside of the snake. And so that kind of was what led me to just kind of create this whole walk through nature. And that's the magic of picture books. And one of my favorite things to do is so the story is told through the text, but the story is also told through the art. And so it was fun to put those hidden elements there um, that aren't necessarily in the text. Um, that children can then see, that readers can see and discover. And then hopefully that gives them that same ability to look out in the real world, look at themselves, look at people that um, if you could imagine, you know, slicing away, there's so much more going on. And so maybe the next time you want to judge someone who is acting angry or just you want to, you know, judge a book by its cover, as they say, maybe just pause and take a moment that there's something else beneath, something that is 
probably more relatable to you than maybe you know, even for animals. Um, so kind of like Ty has said, I just hope to foster more compassion and just create those moments where people take a moment um, to really think about um, others and uh, what might be going on and then hopefully make us all more compassionate towards each other. That's super illuminating. Thank you so much. And, you know, to touch upon, you know, your st status as dual illustrator and writer, the next question. So, so, so certainly all of us know those, those who have not yet published a children's book may not know that as a writer, as the writer of a story using the words, we often have to work with a editor, right? At the publishing company. Um, and they work with us on editing the words. But you, what a lot of people might not know is an illustrator also has to deal with a designer at the publisher, right? Uh, so can you talk a little bit about what that process was like? What like what is it to, how is it to work uh, as an illustrator with the designer of the publishing house? So it's actually pretty similar. So just as an editor will help you rewrite your text, to make sure the story, the message is as clear as possible. Um, an art director usually helps you analyze your art and make sure the story or the images, what you're trying to convey there is also as clear as possible. So usually I start with very simple sketches. My sketches are usually very, very rough um, just because I know there's probably gonna be many changes, uh, but just a lot of back and forth um, usually I even like to see, do they understand what I'm saying the first time I send it in? And um, if they don't, sometimes that's even the biggest telltale sign that I need to rework uh, that image. Um, but really it's, I wish it was more exciting <laughs> than that, but really it's just another person. Um, Cause I know we get so close to our work sometimes it's, you know, it's helpful to have that uh, distance view from someone else with fresh eyes to kind of maybe see um, what we assumed was there um, or was apparent. Uh, so I know for Beneath, especially, uh, there was a lot more back and forth in um, how to make sure those Beneath images stood out. Um, I did have a couple rounds where they actually kind of glowed. There was kind of this halo around them. Uh, we had to play around with how dark we could push the areas in the background because um, there's also a whole technical side because the art has to print then, you know, the colors print correctly, um, what kind of paper you're going to use. And so we did go a lot of, of back and forth on how to make sure that the colors still stood out and that part still stood out. And just that balance between the above and the beneath and that maybe the beneath stood out, but that they were both important parts of the image. Uh, because that's the whole point of the story, too, is that both of these parts matter, your outer and inner worlds. Uh, so, yeah, I always enjoy that process because uh, it's so interesting to hear what they have to say or just I always try to keep in mind that we are a team. So even when they ask for that millionth round of changes, you're like, we're a team. <laughs> we both want the best book possible. Um, but yeah, really, I, I assume or I feel it's very similar to working with an editor. They just want to help you make sure that your story, your message is as clear as possible. Great. Thank you. And thank you so much for reminding us that the illustrator, in this case, you doing both jobs, <laughs> how critical that is to the storytelling of a book. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, Junata, so what a powerful, visionary, vital book for kids. You you talked about this a little bit, um, you know, in the previous question about that, that it was adapted from a viral poem uh, of yours. And you talked, you talked a, bit, a little bit about the genesis, like the, the start of that poem and the history behind it. But can you talk a little bit about the process of adapting it, that poem into a children's book? Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel like, uh, this book was like, you know how some people, I mean, I haven't, I have a child, but I didn't give birth to my child. How they're like, oh, that pregnancy, oh my gosh, that birth was so hard. And then this other birth was like, oh my God, I, you know, two minutes, that baby was out. That's what I felt like the kid's book was like, because I've written, my first book was a young adult novel. And that was like, 
Oh my gosh. Like so much writing, so much writing, so many feelings in a good way, but like literally like bawling, crying up. You like, I do feel like some of these longer projects can feel almost like a exorcism. Just kidding, but not kidding. Um, so I feel like it was definitely like, oh wow, like my first novel was my first novel. And there also was a lot of pressure with that. So I kind of feel like this was like a bonus where I was like, okay, here's this poem that I think if I were like, oh, I need to write a kid's book about the police state and abolition and whatever, then I think it would have been a lot more maybe angsty or something. Um, but to me, it was kind of like I'd lived with this poem in the world for so long and really um, got to get used to it just being in the world. So when it became a kid's book, it felt like a bonus. And it was beautiful to like get to work with my illustrator and be like, oh, you know, them, um, their name is Kristen Uroda. They're really dope, based in Detroit. Um, and really kind of getting to see the collaboration of like her brain and her approach and her practice activated and essentially the poem you know had been around forever and my editor sent some tweaks and I was like yes except no leave the same yes except no leave the same so it was flowy like that um I yeah so I think that uh what it ended up feeling like was like these little birthday gifts or Christmas gifts or something like where there'd be a dimension of you know first she just did the sketches and I was like, oh my gosh, like this is what she sees the grandma looks like. Or I like how she interpreted that particular grandma who's like a tall, dark skinned brother or, you know, this little kid with Afro puffs. Um, I do feel like it's interesting hearing you, Corey, talk about your brain as an illustrator because that's just not my art practice. So it is like magician work to see somebody else be like, oh, this is how you were able to interpret that. Um, so it was really fun, actually. I think it also was healing, like I shared, because the poem was such a, like, even sometimes when I initially would read the poem, I was like, this, and I don't mean to, like, it felt not corny, but I was like, oh, it's like, like, it just was like this kind of super happy, upbeat poem in a way that, like, I've been writing poetry since I've been a teen, and it's always been emo and, like, I'm in love and, uh, you know, so this poem very much felt like, and actually not corny, but like, I think uh, it reminded me actually of some of the poetry that I liked as a young person that maybe, um, and I wouldn't say corny, let me like extract corny, like you don't got to erase it from the thing, but you know, I, I want to, I think for me, it felt like, oh, okay, this is just a poem for joy in a way that I don't think I'm always comfortable with joy. You know, so maybe that's kind of me telling on myself a little bit, but it reminded me of poets that, you know, kind of like Maya Angelou, where it's like lyrical and inspiring and whatnot. And um, so it felt really cool to see the ways that it could be so grounded and accessible visually, because I do think, you know, visual language is just an additional language. And I think that's the beautiful alchemy of kids book. It's like, oh, here's this lyrical and poetic world, um, you know, like Laura was speaking to and, you know, how you think about your process, but then it gets to be visual and then you get to be in a movie, but then it gets to be a cozy little offering to, you know, your little person or to yourself, you know, like I think yeah, like, I think there's a lot of kids books that, you know, sort of speak to the things that, you know, like Ty's speaking to that you wish you had as a kid. You know, we sometimes read books specifically to kind of do healing work with our kids self. Um, so yeah, so I feel like that was the gift the illustrator gave me was a another way to be in relationship with the poem. Um, and B to like have a book in the world that I didn't have to be like, every morning, every night, be like, oh, here's more pages, here's more chapters. I mean, I, yeah, anyways, I'm being very dramatic when it comes to writing novels, but I feel like writing novels are really dramatic. And I don't know what it's like if, you know, to approach another kid's book, you know, where I'm like going into it knowing it's a kid's book. So it has been really dope just hearing everybody's process, you know, about, you know, coming up with an idea and like, you know, advancing it into that space. Thank you for that great answer. Uh, it, it just strikes me that so many of us who come from historically marginalized communities are writing these these books we wish we had when we were kids and are, as you beautifully stated, is a, a type of self-healing, right, that we put into the world. And so with that note, um, is there another children's book in your future? Do you have ideas? Uh, 
that that you want to put out in the world for for a next children's book for you? Hmm. That's a good question. It's funny because my daughter um like was over my shoulder reading my young adult novel. And um there's a scene in it where there's somebody kissing, like, you know, and she's 10 and she's like, and she looks at me and just like looks back at the page. And she's like, that's cringe. You know, like that's cringe. And kids don't like that, you know? And I was like, well, this isn't exactly a kid's book. This is like for older kids. And then I started like kind of asking her, I was like, you know, what kind of kid's book would you be into, you know, because, you know, you try, we try to make these dollars, girl, you might got it inside. I don't know, you know, um, and not that it's about that, obviously, but I do think it is interesting to be like, oh yeah, like what are the different age groups I can speak to? Because I think, you know, and as being a writer, like a lot of my work before I became a published author, I should say, because I've always written, but before becoming an author was very much in the performance realm and kind of like DIY punk creative performance art. Um, and then I had an idea for a poem or for a young adult novel. And then all of a sudden I'm like, wow, like in this magical world of people who write for kids, which I do feel grateful that was the world of publishing that I got delved into because young people are so real, like my daughter. And um, I do feel like as a young person, I really longed and appreciated books that made me feel seen and real. Um, so I think as far as another kid's book, you know, I definitely have ideas. Like I definitely have ideas. I definitely am curious about, um, I don't know, like, I guess I don't have like an, a specific idea. Like, I feel like my daughter's obsessed with cats. And um, I feel like there's a way that her cat um, really kind of came in as a healer for her. Like, I do think that hu sometimes other human interactions, especially after the pandemic, um, it was awkward for her to connect with people socially. I think a lot of people with kids experienced after the pandemic an additional sort of like complexity to kids being social. Like they got very social on iPads um, at times and then also felt, you know, kind of anxious in the world again. So I think that there's a way that me experiencing her have a cat because growing up, you know, like my family they're West Indian, they're Caribbean. Like my mom was like, that's, I have to feed y'all. Like I'm going to get animal to clean up. And like, so for her, a cat was just like, wow, y'all really want to put me to work. Um, but with my daughter, I was like, oh my gosh, like I really seen how her cats, like I really got to have my heart opened up around the ways that animals are healers. Um, I also have been really, and this is like in my next book, I'm writing about this too, but like people who communicate with animals, like animal communicators who literally, there's this podcast that I can send to everybody um, and it's an animal communicator. And she like literally will hear what these animals feel. And these animals are deep, you know, of course. And, you know, I think like I have such a fascination with the ways that like humans really pathologize other species, you know, like in, in all kinds of ways. And I feel like there's so much we can learn from species. Like last year I did this um, play called Impact Theory and it was like sort of this like black girl Goonies, Stand By Me, Wiz, Dinosaur, Land Before Time situation. And it was also kind of like a Vogue ball. So I like got all my friends who Vogue to be a part of it. It was like in a puppet show. And a lot of what I wanted to think about dinosaurs, because essentially it's like these girls go back in time through a portal into the dinosaur land. And um, I was like, I didn't want to write dinosaurs the way that like kind of the kind of patriarchal white imagination is like, oh, dinosaurs, they would eat us. Like, and I love Jurassic Park, don't get me wrong. Like I read like all of them books when I was 12. But it was also like, oh, the dinosaurs want to just eat us. And that's all they think about is just eating humans. And I was like, so I wrote it as like dinosaurs, as like these spiritual kind of voguing beings. It was like a house of dinosaur. And so I don't know if that's the direction I'll go. But um, I do feel like curious about how um, I think children sort of bring us to see different dimensions um, and, you know, consulting with my daughter because she's going to keep it a stack for me. So Stay tuned, people. I'm sure she's going to be like in my writer's credit and my IP and my portion of the money. Because these kids know they're worth these years. You know, that's it. <laughs> well, now that you told us that you might write a children's book 
called House of Dinosaurs about where that the dinosaurs are these spiritual, beautiful beings. I kind of feel like you have to do it now. No, and Bao, you know, like Bao, like we went to the same high school and he was like the grown, cool poet who actually you like were the first person to introduce, introduce me to the idea of spoken word poetry. So I feel like always so grateful how you see me and reflect that. So thank you. That is so kind of you. Thank you so much. If I if I have done any good in your life, then I'm I'm grateful. So thank you. Thank you. All right. So so last but certainly not least, we have Laura. Um, so this wonderful book, Laura, is about uh, a pair of loons, who's um, you know spoiler alert for those of you who haven't read the book yet. Um, the loons basically lose their eggs, their babies, and they they happen upon a duckling and they raise it as their own. Um, can you talk, and it's based on a true story, actually. And so can you talk about what drew you to this particular story, how you made it your own? And I, I also see that you did a whole lot of research and consulted a, lunch, a bunch of wildlife specialists. And so can you can you kind of talk about both what drew you to the story and the research and consultation you had to do to get to the story? Sure. And I, I have to say, I just love hearing all of y'all's creativity and your different approaches. This is amazing. Um, what drew me to this particular true story uh, was an editor. Carol Hens knew I had written about loons and she had seen this true story. There was a photo that kind of went viral. It was so cute. And um, Carol and I had worked on many books together and we were having lunch. And she said, hey, have you heard about this loon? And I am so out of the loop always. And I said, no, <laughs> I have no idea. Um, and she said, well, and she told me about this true story that had happened in Wisconsin and said, I, I think this should be a picture book. Would you be interested in trying to write something about it? So the idea was not, or the topic was not mine. You know, it was a true story and an editor approached me to possibly write about it. And this sounds wonderful, like, oh, an editor coming to you and saying, hey, do you want to write this? But it was very anxiety provoking because then the whole thing became, well, how do I make that my own? You know, it's a true story. It's fascinating, um, but it's not a story that I felt passionate about at the beginning and thought, I've got to write about this. And that's usually how I begin a picture book is, oh, I have this idea or this factual thing that, you know, that I feel like I have to write about. So it was early 2020, by the time I had done some of the initial research and started sort of brainstorming different approaches, you know, do I put the researchers who discovered this whole situation in the book or are they just resources? And is it gonna be folksy? Is it gonna be funny? Is it gonna be just straight scientific prose? Is it going to be mysterious? And so I was looking at all these different um, possible moods and approaches. And then lockdown happened uh, right after I had made my list that I thought, okay, I've got my choices, you know. Uh, and then as the world shut down, I, I wasn't consciously aware of this as I was writing. It's only in looking back afterward. Um, that I realized probably what drew me to the really mysterious kind of approach, um, besides the fact that I love mysterious nonfiction, like Candy Fleming's uh, Giant Squid was a, a big mentor text for me. Um, but I think really in writing this story, which has an unknown ending, there are a lot of things that the scientists don't know and that we won't ever know the answer to. And I think that it was kind of my way of, of reassuring myself that, um, you know, scary, terrible things happen as they were happening as I was writing it. And we can still, you know, we can still make a family and we can still go on somehow, you know, in, despite all the, all the losses and all the, the realization of how little power we have in the world. 
So I think this, I think that's how I ended up making it my own. I think I was just writing, you know, not for kids who needed it. I think I was writing it because it's what I needed. Sorry, I did not mean to get emotional about this. It doesn't usually make me teary. Um, so it was really interesting to look back at it after the book came out and and kind of realize, oh, the light bulb, you know, finally went off that maybe that's what really drew me to that approach to telling the story. Um, and then the, the nonfiction piece of it. Yeah, the research was really challenging on this because this unusual family that happened in uh, Northern Wisconsin in 2019, and there was really just one small group, um, the Loon Project, and they were the ones who discovered it um, in their loon research, and they were my only source, which is kind of terrifying if you're writing a nonfiction story to only have one, you know, kind of small set of people you could go to. Um, and so Dr. Walter Piper, who leads the Loon Project, um, you know, answered a gazillion questions for me and shared the the field notes that all the different volunteers and members of the team take. And um, Linda Grenzer, who's a volunteer photographer, shared all her images and videos. And I, I couldn't have told this story without them because um, all I would have had were kind of the blog posts and articles that many news sources shared um, that, you know, that were just relying on, on those couple of sources without any depth at all. And the the um the name of the lake one funny research story so it was terrifying the research being so limited so in depth but very narrow with just this one set of people uh but one funny thing was kind of from some of these uh maybe the smithsonian or the audubon's posts and i found it several other places too they were talking about long lake in Oneida County in Wisconsin is where this unusual family was, was living. And so I'm in an attempt to research from other places too. You know, I'm doing all this looking up of this particular lake and what fish are actually in this lake and what trees are right along um, the coast of the shoreline, you know, so that I can be accurate, factual, true, and so I found some information. Uh, and then when I was emailing back and forth with Walter and I asked him something about, you know, the tree that was near the, the nest or whatever, he said, oh yeah, that's not the actual lake. <laughs> we released the, we released an incorrect name so that, you know, bloggers and press would not descend on the lake and scare the loons off and and break up the family and all this kind of stuff. So here I was, you know, wasting my time trying to do all this online research and not have to talk to real people, um, which is my preferred method of research, not talking to real people. Um, and then it turned out I was researching a lake where, you know, had nothing to do with this story. So. Um, well, those of you who so don't know, those of you who don't know writers, it's it's doesn't surprise me that a fellow writer would go to great lengths not to speak to fellow human beings. So that's not a huge surprise. So, uh, you know, another part of your book is there are there are moments that are very subtle, like there are hints about what's going on, but you never actually name the specificity of it. So one example is that uh, we see we see the loon, the unfortunate shattered loons eggs. But we, you never say what actually happens. And there are hints there, you know, through the book, there are hints that maybe it was a weasel that we see in the background, or maybe it was a, a bird of prey or something, right? Um, so can you talk about, uh, like, was that a decision on your part? Or was that a collaboration with the illustrator? Like, how, how did you make decisions like that? Sure. Um, so the Loon Project, the, the team members only observed these water birds maybe eight or nine times, I think, over the summer. 
So it wasn't like there was a um, webcam set up that was live streaming. You know, it wasn't like, oh, watch the wolf den and you can see them 24 hours a day. So I just had this very small concrete set of facts about what they actually did. And because it's a nonfiction book, I only wanted to include what we really knew happened. And, you know, what happened was on one date, they recorded that there was a nest with two eggs. And then the next time they went, um, shortly after a storm, the eggs were in shards. There were no chicks. And then they discovered what they thought was another chick because it was a brand new volunteer who had never seen a loon chick. And that ended up being a mallard duckling. Um, but it, basically in the text, if it wasn't a known fact, I, I didn't want to speculate. I wanted to, in fact, I really wanted to celebrate the fact that we don't know. Um, and that all we can do is, is look at the information we have, but there are going to be a million things we don't know the answers to. And so in the text, I was very, um, you know, I, I didn't assume anything or try to make a deduction and, and put that in the text. And the, the illustrator, Alexandria Neonakis, um, kind of took the same approach. You know, she didn't show anything definitely happening that was not actually recorded by the, by the, re the researchers. Um, and we had the text and the, the art you know, vetted at several different stages to try to make sure we were staying as accurate as possible and just giving enough information that kids could, you know, try to infer what was happening and maybe come to their own thoughts about what they feel probably happened, um, but also make peace with the idea that we don't know for sure and we aren't ever going to know for sure. Uh, so that was kind of the there was no discussion about it. Um, it was just kind of, here's what we know. So this is all we can really, this is all we can show. That's fascinating. Thank you so much for that. You know, I think, I don't know, maybe it's Western culture where there's such an expectation of mastery, right? Where like if if you have created something or you're the expert or something or if it's something you do, you're expected to know like all the answers at the highest level. But that's not the reality, right? The reality is no matter how much you know about something, there's probably much more that you don't know. And so thank you so much for bringing that up, um, you know, as a strategy and as an outlook for creating art. Thank you so much. Thanks. Well, thank you all. You all are amazing, beautiful, wonderful creators. It's so wonderful to have some time with you and chat about your beautiful books. Those of you who not have not yet uh, gotten these books, I encourage you, please go out and get them. If you Usually if you ask an author, like, what can I do to help you? Buy their book. Buy their book. Buy their book. Buy their book. Tell the libraries to buy their books. Uh, buy the books for family, friends, uh, for, for other kids buy their books, buy their books, get their work out there, help them get their books out there. All of you watching, of course, thank you so much for taking part in this. Uh, meet the finalist panel. The internet is a infinite space. We are so glad that you chose to spend a little bit of time with us. Thank you for that. If you enjoyed this particular talk, you can find a treasure trove of past events archived on the YouTube channel of the Minnesota Book Awards Steward Organization, the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. You can find out more about future programs on their website, thefriendsoneword.org. In particular, mark your calendars for Tuesday, May 7th. That's the big event, the big evening that the winner of this category and eight others are finally revealed. Of course, again, I, I really mean it when I say you are all winners. This is a beautiful kid-lit uh, community that we have here in Minnesota. Getting your books out to, to kids is already, you've already won. And yet, for the sake of ceremony, one of you will be will be crowned the victor on May 7th. Uh, join us in St. Paul at the Ordway Center for the Performing Arts. Tickets are just $22, including processing fees. Visit thefriends.org MNBA for details. Again, thank you all for joining us. And uh, writers, thank you so much and best of luck.